Welcome to End of Life University. In today's video, I'm sharing with you an interview I did with Gary Wiederspahn, who is a board member of the Final Exit Network, but has also served as a Peace Corps director and traveled in over 20 countries. Today, he shares slides and stories about the end of life rituals he observed during his travels. And I think you'll find it really fascinating as I did. So if you're watching the video, at least you get to see all of his slides which those who are only listening to the audio will miss out on. Before we start this interview, though, I want to remind you to go to my page at eoluniversity.com slash support, where you'll find three ways you can step up and help out the YouTube channel and the podcast to keep us on the air. You can support either through my Patreon page, through a PayPal donate button, or also through buy me a coffee. So check out EOLUniversity.com slash support. And also remember to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thanks for watching and we'll get on with the video. Today, I'm very happy to welcome my guest, Gary Wiederspahn. Gary is a board member of Final Exit Network. He is the author of Intercultural Services, a worldwide guide and source book, and many articles on cross-cultural communication and relations. He has traveled in over 20 countries and served as Peace Corps director in Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Ecuador. And you can learn more about the work that Gary does and read some of his blogs at two different websites, finalexitnetwork.org and the Good Death Society blog.net. So Gary, welcome and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Karen. I'm delighted that you invited me. I look yeah. forward to it. Well, I'm really interested to hear because I know um, from reading about you that as you have traveled to various countries, you had a particular interest in end of life customs and rituals. And so I'm so excited to learn from you and hear what you have to share. But maybe you could start out just by telling us your story. First, what attracted you to the Peace Corps and the travel you've done and then to focus in on on end of life customs. Well, I spent the 1960s and the 1970s living and working in different countries and uh, being very uh, intimately involved with uh, working with the people on their own cultures. And I really, um, um, it's a lifelong interest that I've had trying to find out where other people are coming from and relating to them in, in a uh, respectful way. There's something uh, called... Um, uh, appreciative inquiry. I don't, don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a way of asking questions of people that shows that you're sincerely interested and you respect what they're into. And that just opened up so many uh, doors, one of which is uh, when people were grieving and, and celebrating uh, the, the lives of their ancestors and that kind of thing. So I, uh, that became sort of a, one of the spinoffs for me. Then I spent uh, uh, two decades after that, the uh, um, 80s and the 90s, packaging what we've learned about how to get along with other people and work with them and, and uh, on a respectful, mutual uh, basis. And we uh, did cross-cultural training and consulting for global corporations. Globalization was a big thing in those days. And so we developed one of the first major cross-cultural training companies. And uh, then my next career after that tended more to be toward the end of life things because I was getting toward the end of my life. And uh, so I've been involved with Final Exit Network now on the board for nine, nine years. And uh, the two areas come together, the, 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 the cultural adventuring and uh, uh, practices and, and beliefs about uh, death and dying, how, how diverse they are. So interesting. I love that term appreciative inquiry. Is mm -hmm. that, do I have that right? That's, that's right. There's a whole, that's, there are books on that subject, but it's really like magic. People really know you're not putting them down and you're truly interested in trying to get into their shoes. Uh, I, I can't think of any place in the world where people don't open up and respond. 
Mm. Well, I, def- I definitely want to read about that because I feel like that's something we need to foster again right now in this world. We need that skill of, of being able to, to talk to one another. But it occurs to me that when you learn about the end of life customs and rituals of a society or culture, you really learn a lot about who they are and what they value. That, that that's a pretty rich subject area when you're when when you're studying a group of people and wanting to know how they think and and what they care well, the, about. Well, the two points are birth and death, where where they they both tend to be really uh, deeply emotional and spiritual and uh, and uh, uh, deep culture we call it, uh, as opposed to you know culture being uh, fashions or. Uh, cuisine or that kind of thing. It's, a, it's like an iceberg. And the, the stuff you see up in the top above the surface uh, is interesting. But when you get down below the surface of, of the values and uh, that drive that uh, stuff that's going on on the surface, that's where it gets very interesting. Yeah. And I just a, a more general question. Did you find that people have more things in common than they have differences or is that is that a valid thing to say or do the differences between cultures really stand out and so gary we're 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 you're now in a different location because we had a little bit of a technical glitch there but i wanted to carry on with our discussion and ask you as you studied these various cultures especially around their end of life traditions did you find similarities between them or was it primarily differences that you found um i was really i had to back up a little bit i was born in 1940 and back then, people died at home, surrounded by loved ones, and uh, there was a religious aspect to it, probably, usually, but not in institutions. And so in these countries, sorry about that uh, phone, uh, these countries, that's uh, where I lived in these very l- rural locations, um, uh, in these communities, it was pretty much like that. So it wasn't until I came back to the United States after about 20 years living in villages abroad and working with the Peace Corps that I uh, was I had what they call re-entry shock. Came back into my own culture and I thought, my God, uh, there's a big taboo here about talking about death. And uh, in these places that I've been living in and adapting to, um, it's just a part of of life. There's, there's no inhibition or hang up about uh, uh, being around dead people or, or in uh, um, ceremonies uh, that have to do with death. And uh, so the contrast between that and what I discovered when I returned to the U.S. was quite an eye opener to me. That's one of the reasons I probably have gotten more involved in understanding the difference. It seems like a lot of places around the globe, they share a common feeling, you know, birth, life, death, it's all one thing. Uh, And, but when we come uh, in our culture, I think we're the uh, kind of the outlier that um, my impression is that uh, the medical profession, you're a doctor, uh, a lot of doctors uh, seem to feel uh, that when someone dies, they failed. And therefore, the, the job is to keep the, you know, the people dying as long as possible and to not have that on your conscience or, or, or the record of, of your uh, medical institution, right? And, uh, and we outsourced. In this country, we outsourced uh, dying to professionals. Um, and so we've lost um, agency. We lost control over what actually happens our choices became very limited. So that was, a, that, as I said, that was a real eye opener for me. Oh, I can imagine. And you're so right about that. You know, in, in this country, we have the blessing of advanced technology and medicine and rapidly advancing knowledge, but it has also been a curse and a detriment in that it's, it has been easy to outsource care of people at the end of life and care after death and during death. 
to other people who who take over professionals who do all the work of it and then in our day-to-day -day lives we've lost our connection to death well in the uh, period of time when i was doing cross-cultural training in the united states for corporations um, um, some of their foreign employees coming to the united states we needed to develop training programs for them and that was an issue you know uh, how do americans die and I came across some studies that show that we don't die. It's really kind of curious. We, we fade away, we pass. You know, we, uh, at my sister's funeral, they were saying she went to be with Jesus and, you know, all kinds of uh, things that we try to uh, cover up the reality of it by the, our language. And uh, that was part of the eye opening experience that. Uh, I, I think that's starting to fade a little bit now. You know, the death positive movement, the end of life, the doula movement, uh, of course, Hemlock and, and the Right to Die organizations like uh, uh, Final Exit Network and Compassion and Choices. It's starting to change a little, but, but uh, I, I think we've got a lot of more work to do. I was going to say that too. It's really good to see all these new movements. It's so it's refreshing and it gives me a lot of hope for the future, but we do have a lot of ground to make up and we're in my profession of medicine. I I'm concerned that it's very hard. It's very hard to make changes and shift mindsets within the medical system. So, so we, we have a lot of work to do there and people like me who are part of that system need to be, need to be working on it to get it to change. Well, I'm excited to get into some of the content that you have to share. And I wanted to mention for people just listening to the podcast, Gary has uh, slides that he'll be sharing with us that you can view on YouTube on the video. So you won't be able to see the slides, but you can hear us talk about them. If you're just listening to the audio, you can always go back though and listen to listen or watch this on, uh, on YouTube later. So let me see if I can get the slides up and running here. Let me see. There we are. Um, so it says, oops, did I shift it already? You uh, went to slide two, but that's okay. okay. Customs of death and dying, vast cultural diversity. So, and these are great pictures. Are these all your own photos, Gary? From um, Some of them are, not this one, no. And uh, you start with a slide on Mexican Day of the Dead. Mm -hmm. This is the one, yeah, you jump, you jump to New Orleans, Orleans there. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Mexican Day of the Dead. Um, and it's both through Central America. Uh, I, I really, I lived in Guatemala um, and uh, got very deeply into the Mayan cultures there. There are many, many different uh, uh, Mayan language and linguistic groups and, 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 and cultures. And uh, they uh, share this uh, connection with their ancestors in a way that uh, Mexicans, of course, uh, do that during the Day of the Dead. But, but in, in, in Guatemala, for example, it's, I think it's even stronger. There's some wonderful ceremonies. Uh, um, are you familiar with the, with the uh, temples, uh, Mayan temples out in Tikal in the jungle? Uh, yes, yes. There's a, a big lake there called Flores Lake, and at the end of the lake, there's a little teeny uh, village, cobblestone streets, whitewashed adobe kind of place, and they have a little teeny chapel, you know, um, the size of my garage, and inside that uh, temple, uh, under the altar, they have two skulls, and these are skulls that local people believe belong to the last two real Mayan uh, leaders. Uh, uh, in, in their area, and they are brought out during the uh, period of time that, uh, the, uh, uh, um, that people celebrate the Day of the Dead, and they're taken around from one home to the other, every home in the village, and uh, there are drinks and, and special foods, it's, it's delicious, and they serve everybody, and they are carried on a kind of a litter and with tons of flowers, it's, it's just a beautiful experience. And you see that in the cemeteries. There are people there that are, are, are uh, 
having some tequila, some, some great uh, uh, authentic Mexican uh, food that the abuela has prepared, their kids, their mariachis. It's not a sad thing, it's a very happy thing. And these kids on this slide show that, you know, it's not scary, it's kind of you know, like fun. I've even seen little kids, 12 year old boy eating a, a, a sugar uh, skull, you know, a candy in the shape of a skull with his name on it. And he was giggling and he's saying, I'm eating death, you know? Hmm. So, so it, there's a certain uh, wonderful uh, feeling of naturalness to it uh, that uh, you don't see elsewhere. I love all the bright colors and the flowers everywhere and the, you know, the skull paintings on the faces. And yeah, uh, as you said, it's wonderful that it, the entire family participates so that children get comfortable right away with the topic of death and, and remembering their ancestors. And they have, they also have what they call ofrendas, which are like little shrines with the photograph of grandpa and his favorite brand of, uh, you know, uh, a liquor and uh, some flowers and what he liked to eat and so on. It's, and everybody in the family puts that together as kind of a celebration of a life rather than mourning a death. Mm. That's that's very beautiful. This is that's a great photo of to symbolize what you're talking about. And then the next one that I clicked on too soon was the New Orleans funeral parade. Also, it seems like a joyous celebration. Uh, this one is interesting. I've I've witnessed. Oh, oh. Okay, I'm, uh, we're back in New Orleans. Back in New Orleans. I don't the, know. The point there is, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, our, the African American community brought with them when they came to the United States, I think, many of these kind of similar feelings of, uh, of community sharing and, and grief. And it's almost like the Irish, uh, what do they call the uh, uh, wakes? The wake. Mm -hmm. But, but with a lot of color and sound and music, I think that's uh, a real contribution to our culture. Yes, absolutely. And again, bright colors, it's like this joyous energy that you can see and feel. Yeah. The, the next slide, Karen, is, is I think it's kind of, Adam, my wife and I were, uh, we do, we, we've gotten back up a little bit. There we go, if, there it is. This is um, kind of a Hindu uh, influence on the island of Bali. Uh, and uh, the custom there is that when people die, they're put into the ground. And uh, when the uh, village, uh, usually it's the, the more uh, affluent people in the village are able to put together um, uh, all the trimmings and the cost of, and uh, associated with the cremation, then everybody gets their folks out of the ground, brings them in, and, and uh, they're put in these beautiful uh, sort of pinata kind of things. And they have a, uh, a big uh, fire, and then the ashes are taken down to the beach, and they have little teeny boats made out of uh, uh, palm frond, not. Um, Look, uh, they're, they're kind of leaves bent in a certain shape of like a canoe and they're put out on the surf and then the ashes are taken away to the ocean. And, and the day before this, something really interesting goes on. These, these little bundles of uh, remains of different people are brought into kind of a central plaza and uh, put in a pyramid. And what I noticed there was that the people who are Big shots before their death remain big shots after the death because the priority of your place in the, in the uh, pyramid depend on the social structure of the community. Mm, interesting. Uh, and Anne and I were there, uh, just happened into the small village the, the day that this, uh, this uh, the sacrifice, the uh, uh, offerings were brought, you know, food, the, um, um, a lot of different. Uh, tropical fruits and so on and flowers uh, and these bundles all piled up and that evening uh, quite a number of people felt here's where appreciative inquiry comes in 
they, they really felt like they were in communication somehow with their beloved ancestors. They could hear them, they could, in some cases, almost see them, and they felt that the veil between the living and the dead uh, it was very thin. That happens in the Day of the Dead. That happens elsewhere around the world. That's some, one of the commonalities. That there are certain periods when it's possible to be in touch somehow with the people who have gone before. That's so interesting that it's a village cremation, so multiple bodies being cremated at once. And then are the ashes mingled together or are they kept separate? They're kept separate. At least in this village they were, yeah. So each family retrieves their the ashes of their loved one to to take down and put on the, the little boats. Right. That then float out on the water. Yeah. That's it, so it, interesting. It's really incredible. Um Another thing that, as an interculturalist, which is part of my training, was really interesting to me, is that uh, these, these cultures have another thing often in common, which is extended families. You know, when, when I say, the, when I did cross-culture training for people in cultures like this, I'd say, well, uh, how do you uh, describe family, familia? What is a familia? How many people? And oftentimes, like in, uh, in Latin America, they'll say, you know, 48 people. Hmm. And it'll include cousins and uncles and aunts and, and grandparents and all that. And, uh, and that's a strong contrast to our nuclear family here in the States, you know. And what became uh, uh, obvious to me is that you can't ex escape this fan familial molecule that you belong to simply by dying. You're still part of the family. Hmm. The past people and the present people and the future people that come, we're all still uh, connected with each other. And that seemed to have given people, um, when I inquired appreciatively, that uh, this is, gives them a strong feeling of uh, security, that uh, we, we all belong to each other and uh, it gives us support when we face the, the you know challenges and tragedies of life that's so interesting that they have these um well it's almost like the continuing bonds that we talk about now in grief therapy but that they feel so strongly the bonds they have with their ancestors with their living relatives and it sounds to me like they accept one another the the good and the bad like you're part of our family you're part of our family we may not like you <laughs> very much yeah. but oh, yeah. you're there we're connected uh, yeah, that, of course that leads to lots of other interesting things on the cultural viewpoint but uh, it really comes into play during special times of uh, uh, joy or, or, or grief yeah. yes yes i can see why uh, that it's such a strong foundation um, to to grieve from and to experience challenges from just to feel that you you have all these other people backing you up and caring about you. All right, we'll see if I can get this to only go one slide at a time. <laughs> there we go. Korean burial beads. Hmm, I've oh, never heard of this. Oh, here's a little high-tech uh, approach. <laughs> the Koreans have taken the ashes after a cremation and continued uh, a process of, of, of reducing them to these crystals. And they uh, have different ways of color. And uh, this is a popular color so that you can keep your ancestor, you know, on a mantle here and or on a, um, a coffee table. And it's, it's quite attractive. Hmm. It, is, it is beautiful. That's how, how very interesting. It's, it's beyond cremation. It's one more step. In yeah. Technology. <laughs> yeah. And um, but turning the ashes into something that you don't mind looking at. I mean, they can be in this clear crystal container because they're they're beautiful as these beads to look at. And then uh, Vietnamese procession. Oh, that's interesting. That's really a, a lovely picture. Very interesting. Yeah, this kind of illustrates that people who are important before their uh, death are continuing to be important 
afterwards and the proper ceremony has to be given to. And a lot of that includes a display uh, like the Chinese, uh, the, there are, um, there's a Chinese subculture in Vietnam uh, and they would use the uh, burning of the uh, paper uh, uh, money to send mm -hmm. up in the clouds to, to be with uh, grandpa so he has something to spend and other kinds of things along those lines, sending grave goods essentially along with you. But this is part of a display, honoring people um, in an appropriate way that uh, the family within the community feels like they're being recognized and honored. So it's this for the living as for the dead, actually. Yeah, it shows a procession through the streets that kind of reminded me of the New Orleans parade in yeah, a sense. Yeah, There's similarities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then carrying the casket, which is really ornately decorated. Mm -hmm. But everyone also has on, it looks like traditional costumes, who's part of the procession. These are, I, I, I've been accused of cross-cultural adventuring, but that's, I really, it's, it's, it's true. I just love to be involved with these people on their terms. Yeah, how fascinating. And did it just happen that, well, I mean, as life and death are, they ha they're happening all the time around us, but you just happen to be in the right place at the right time to experience these, these rituals as they were happening? Well, when you're doing, uh, when you're leading uh, development uh, projects and villages, um, and you've got Peace Corps volunteers, I was Peace Corps director, and part of my job was to uh, support the, the, the volunteers and get them into uh, uh, projects that would uh, be something that the community would support and that uh, they could uh, make some real progress in the two years that the volunteers were living there. And that required really eating their food, uh, sleeping in, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the village inn. Um, and so when you live at that level of connection with people, as opposed to like the corporate expatriates and the fancy homes and the isolated suburbs in the capital city, uh, you get into situations like this all the time. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're really experiencing day to day life and death is part of day to day life. Let's see. So, OK, oh, I don't know this one personally, but I thought it was really interesting that if you go online and look at the Ghanaian uh, coffins, they can be rocket ships. Uh, here's a great uh, one. The kids carrying the coffin it looks like a big tropical fish there. Uh, some of them are uh, fancy automobiles. Uh, it's another way of uh, um, gaining, keeping and, and displaying your status, even in death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see, the next slide was the, from the India. Fire. And of course, there, and the USS traditional funeral. Uh, Back to India. <laughs> yeah. The, well, we all know along the Ganges River, we've seen pictures, right, of uh, uh, that's a very uh, sacred and uh, honored place to uh, have your body cremated. And then the ashes are thrown into the sacred Ganges. And there's a lot of um, bathing and ritual purification that goes on in, the, in, in that process as well. Um, so uh, the whole cremation versus burial thing varies from, you know, around the globe. But in the Indian, especially the Hindu Indian uh, um, culture, cremation is very, very much a thing. It's getting more and more difficult because of the shortage of firewood. Mm, that's interesting. But, uh, that, uh, let's, let's see the next slide. I, I think that... Uh, uh, depicts a little bit I, what I think is is uh, wrong with this. Uh, uh, what's wrong with this picture? Well, back on. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like yeah, for some uh, reason it's uh, automatically uh, uh, shifting and I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, the U.S. funeral we have a picture of here is tons and tons of, uh, of floral arrangements and a fancy coffin that costs a lot of money, probably will be put in a cement container and uh, 
And uh, this is an example of the outsourcing of death in the United States it's become so darn expensive. There is an organization uh, called the Funeral American Funeral Consumers uh, Associate, Association, mm -hmm. right? Society, society, and they are trying to change this picture to uh, reduce the cost and increase the amount of family uh, uh, control and, and involvement in, 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 in the funerals. Yeah, that's good. It is quite a contrast, isn't it? That compared to these other funeral ceremony ceremonies that are outside on the earth, you know, using the elements of the earth, these large funerals that are, you know, inside a building and feels it feels so artificial in comparison. Yeah, I wouldn't, you know, uh, criticize people, but that's not what I would like. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we have up next. Uh, oh, um, the Asmat people um, um, venerate their their elders by keeping um, pieces of them around mm -hmm. and decorating them and, and keeping them up in the rafters of the roof. Oh, uh, interesting. Um, I didn't experience this personally, but a, a similar ceremony uh, incident happened when Ann and I were in the hill uh, country in uh, northern Philippines. I think I've got a slide on that one. Uh, if we go forward a little bit, we might find it. <laughs> Hopefully I can. I'm trying <laughs> to make these slides work right, but there's- Oh, a... we can okay. skip this one. It's, oh. it's, it's, it's a little secular aspect of the, of the Okay, here's Guatemala. This is Guatemala City on the western side on a ridge that has, whoops, has wind, uh, strong wind close to the Day of the Dead. And here the people make these huge, huge kites, 20 feet in diameter, some of the larger ones. And they're made out of little strips of bamboo, twine, and uh, tissue paper. And each little uh, village or aldea in the, in the city uh, do their own, and they put it up there, and in the afternoon, when the sun from the west goes through them, it looks like, uh, it's amazing. Everybody is bathed in, in different colored lights, and it's it's a real, it's it's a, almost a woo-woo uh, spiritual experience, and, and they feel that's uh, one way that they can honor their ancestors on that, uh, that day. They're so beautiful, the designs, and they're huge, too, so I can imagine that must be spectacular to see all these kites in the air. Well, if they get a good strong wind and they get up high enough so that people are just uh, surrounded by them, it's really amazing. Mm, wow. And it's a good thing to do someday if you want to go to Guatemala City during that period of time towards the end of uh, November. You know, about our thanks, uh, um, what is it, our um, Hall Halloween? Halloween time, yes. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful. Oh, this is now super high tech. Dr. Phil Nietzsche's got this uh, Sarko uh, uh, capsule where a person who is uh, wanting to uh, end their own life on their own terms and want to end their suffering and they're qualified legally to do it, could get in there, push a button, it fills up with uh, nitrogen. They peacefully fall asleep, and then they can be buried in this thing that looks like a space capsule. Hmm. I don't think it's caught on, but it's a it's an interesting contrast to the interesting uh, to to the do it yourself uh, approach to the other slides. And then uh, the Zoroastrian the, the power science of the Zoroastrian subpopulation in in Persia and India, uh, um, what they do with their uh, the, the dead is put them in these special round, almost look like a miniature Colosseum, and then the vultures come down and consume the bodies. And uh, it's kind of like a recycling of life, uh, giving the, 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 the body back to the universe from whence it came, you know, kind of idea. 
And there are also there are problems because they have a shortage now of vultures because of environmental change and pollution and, and pesticides and so on. And so these towers of silence aren't, I think their days are numbered, unfortunately, but that's a different way of, of um, uh, connecting with mother nature uh, and returning. Yeah. So each community might have their own tower and then all of the dead from that community, their, their bodies are placed in the tower. Yeah. Mm, very interesting. So many different customs. Yeah. Oh, and the Irish wake, of course, right? It's yes. <laughs> so drink some good Guinness and uh, have a good time and remember old what's his face and he's there also open casket. Uh, um, you know, got a, 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 a flower on his chest and uh, music going. Yeah. And uh, I think the Irish people have brought us a real gift. To, kind of goes along with the New Orleans, you know. Yeah, uh, the, yeah the idea of celebrating yeah. life even as you're mourning the death. Yeah. <clears throat> and then let's see. Here we go. The Ifa uh, Gao people that live in the high country, they're an indigenous uh, uh, group. Uh, and picture, picture of a, a, a tropical uh, valley filled with uh, rice paddies, a little island of, uh, uh, with three or four thatched roof houses, little huts on stilts, a couple of palm trees, and they're surrounded by uh, Paddies, and to get there, you walk along these edges of the paddy, and you get there, and you come into town, which Ann and I did, one of our adventures, and uh, started, you know, talking with an old gentleman, um, loincloth, barefoot, all his life, um, and some chickens, and a few kids, and uh, running around in, in, uh, in the dirt uh, courtyard, and uh, some of these older people in these isolated locations in the Philippines speak some English because mm -hmm. during the Second World War, they were guides to the, the guerrilla, guerrillas and the, and the U.S. troops. And so I, uh, I was able to communicate with this old gentleman, looked like he was about 80. And he said, well, would you like to meet my grandfather? And I said, wow, <laughs> you must really be old. <laughs> and, and so uh, he said, well, if you if you'll pay for a chicken, we'll make chicken soup and share it together because Grandpa really that was his favorite treat. Mm. And so I gave him a few bucks. We came back a couple hours later, and sure enough, there was chicken boiling over a little campfire, and a map placed out. And uh, they had brought Grandpa down from the rafters, and he was basically some bones and and a skull and and wrapped in a beautiful tapestry and they opened it and put it by, uh, next to uh, on the mat with the rest of us and we had our our chickens uh, a soup was delicious and i said well i, I didn't notice grandpa eating any you know <laughs> and, and the old man smiled and kind of twinkled on his eye and he said well you know he gets the spiritual part we eat the rest oh. <laughs> and and the tourists pay for it <laughs> so it, it was a win-win. A win-win. We really had a good, uh, did, good laugh about that. Did they put a bowl of the soup in front of Grandpa? Oh yeah. Uh huh. So, <laughs> wow. So that's it, amazing. So it's you know it, the oftentimes bodies, what we would call bodies, you know, are, are kept close by, in the it, rafters, under the uh, floorboards, sometimes. Uh, sometimes whole, whole, whole bodies for long periods of time before they actually put the uh, rest. And I appreciate the comfort they seem to have with the decomposing body, which I don't see that existing in our society at all. It seems like we're, that's one of the reasons we outsource it. Everyone's very squeamish about being around a dead body. So it's, this would be unthinkable to most people to keep your dead ancestor in the rafters of your house. Yeah. The, um, I, I don't know if I have a slide of another group, also a different uh, uh, ethnic group, also in the Philippines, indigenous high country. Um, 
their tradition is to take the body and put it in a, uh, make a special wicker chair on the front porch of these little huts and smoke them so mm -hmm. that they, uh, instead of embalming, that's a, their way of embalming, I guess, and so that people can come by and pay their last respects. And that could go on for days and days. And then they um, uh, put them in a fetal, a, a fetal position as they were born. They were also returned in that same posture. And then they put them in, in uh, little handmade coffins and then they hang them on cliffs. I think I have a picture of that. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing a slide of that. Let's see if yeah. that. Uh, should I try? Let me try to no, go let's to keep that. going here. Well, well, we'll come back to it, I guess. We'll, we've got a lot of other ones, <laughs> things to cover in between. Okay. <laughs> so in Eastern Europe, they also have something like the Mexicans and Central Americans do the ofrenda. You can mm. see here the cheese, the bread, the wines, the, the, the grapes, the bottles of beer, uh, and uh, the photograph to, to kind of honor in this case it's probably a grandma based on the pictures yeah. hmm. that's beautiful and then would there be like a, a ceremony of eating the food and drinking the beverages at a certain time you know i don't know about i know that the people uh get all those things during that that period of time they share them it's like a little uh, um fiesta hmm. uh but i don't know what actually happens to those that are put on the shrine Oh, okay. I wouldn't think they'd waste them. Yeah, so they, they were pretty yeah, good to me. <laughs> th those are like the offerings, and then the everyone else is eating the meal. Uh, homemade bread, cheese, borscht, looks like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Huh, that's very nice. I really like that. I love the champagne, looks of that. Some red wine. Yeah, and all the photographs. That's so uh -huh. nice. Ah, the Viking funeral boat. This is a good one. <laughs> yeah, this they, this is kind of a reactment, but the Vikings, you know, that story, right? They put the the faithful dog and the and the uh, uh, sword and the shield and the Viking and his helmet, and then they put uh, throw torches in and let it float out into the sea and and sink, so they can make it to Valhalla, where. Uh, warriors are especially honored. I don't think they do that anymore in Scandinavia, but I, I, here's one that they reenacted. Hmm. That's a beautiful picture, the, the, the way the flames are kind of leaping out. And Oh, and ancient Viking graves. So they also buried people, it sounds like. Yeah, and in the shape of the longboats, right? That's These stones are arranged in the shape of the longboat that the warrior used for his his viking his uh adventures oh interesting all right oh and the mafia funeral procession i just put that in because of elaborateness but let's go to the next slide i think this is really interesting uh in part of my career i had to go to uh had to i got to go to japan many many times setting up a, a joint japanese uh, back up one slide if you can, good. Uh, and there again, when I got close to my Japanese colleagues and they knew I was really interested, kind of opened up this aspect of their culture to me, um, that the, uh, when the, the dead person's uh, body is taken to the crematorium, then the bones and, and ashes come out, then the family has these special uh, long chopsticks, chopsticks that are only used on that occasion, and uh, the, the 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 bones are placed into a container that then has a white cloth on it, and uh, I'll tell you what happens later. But uh, this is the only time when chopsticks are two different people with a pair of chopsticks each pick something up together. Some of these bones are a little awkward and big, and so they do it together. So that's the only occasion where that's appropriate. And there's a big taboo about using chopsticks that way any other place in the culture. Hmm, uh, that's and, that's and so it's interesting. interesting that the kids are involved here too. It's not, you know, nothing yucky about it. 
Yeah, because here after a cremation, it would be the staff at the crematorium, I think, <laughs> who would gather up the bones and and mm. deal with that. But that's very interesting that it's that it's the family that mm. collects them. And the next slide shows you where the bones end up. Lack of space and cost of real estate in Tokyo and all through Japan is so much that um, you have these uh, little teeny high rise sort of shrines all packed together very, very tightly in these cemeteries. And this is where the uh, remains, cremains, I guess we call them, end up. And they put them in here and then um, uh, people bring flowers and, and offerings to them there. They can't afford to have the um, big burial cemeteries that we have. There's no space for it. Hmm. It, it looks like a city, doesn't it? Like a, a miniature of a, of a city with all these towers rising up. Little high rises. Yeah, yeah. high rises. Well, oftentimes in, in, in my trips to Japan, you know, it's inevitable you're going out to drink and eat in restaurants and so on. And uh, my Japanese uh, counterparts, colleagues, made it really uh, 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 clear to me that you never want to stick your chopsticks into your rice bowl and the rice or anything else. Having two chopsticks sticking up is symbolic of their offerings that are given to the dead. That's the only time when two chopsticks are seen oh, vertical. Oh. And, and, and it's a really, you could, you could destroy a business uh, deal because, you know, that kind of a faux pas. Oh, how so, interesting. So there are uh, a lot of interesting uh, ways that the Japanese uh, cultural values surrounding and beliefs surrounding death work their way through, through business culture, popular culture. Hmm. You, you get in an elevator and there's no fourth floor because the word for in Japanese sounds like the word death and that sound, seems unlucky, like our number 13. Yeah, like 13 here, huh, how interesting. So there's all these little cultural nuances once you really get into the culture with the people, it's, it's really, it's, it's broadening, you know, travel is broadening and it's eye-opening and it's a lot of, uh, I, I enjoy it very, very much. Yes, it's just fascinating. And as you said before, it shows us the ways in which we're similar, but also how unique and diverse we are mm -hmm. in how we deal with with death and dying and living. Let's see what else we've got here. Oh, wanna... here we hey, there's, have. The, there's, yeah, there's, the, the, there's the hanging uh, coffins. And earlier you were saying that we don't really, uh, whoops, back we'll up. Back. <laughs> there we go. These coffins, uh, about half of that population, uh, uh, this group is now converted to Christianity, so they don't do this. And the other half, it's mostly the elders, the very honored, high-status elders who still would be using these, these uh, be put in these coffins. And they were hanged on the cliff because back hundreds and hundreds of years ago, this was headhunting country. And they didn't want their people, their uh, elders, uh, bodies to be desecrated by some other group coming through and taking the heads for a trophy. So they put them in these very inaccessible cliffs uh, faces um, propped up there. You, you, you need to have, be a technical rock climber to get to them. That's wow, it. I can't even imagine how they get them there. Do I guess they lower them down from the top to hang on the side well, of the cliff? I, I think what they probably do is make bamboo scaffolding and oh. take them and put them up there and then take the you know, scaffolding that's, away. I think that's how it's done. Wow, that's amazing. And then, so once the, once the uh, coffin is there, it stays there, I imagine. It's not yeah. something they, <laughs> no, no. they don't retrieve it, but their ancestors well, when, stay there. When they're taking the coffin from the village up to these mountain uh, sides, these cliffs, sometimes uh, uh, fluids <laughs> get to touch people, you know, because these coffins aren't watertight or anything. And I just read something recently where that's considered lucky. Huh. That's, that's, that, that is anointment of uh, the, the blessing from your ancestor. 
Wow. Uh, doesn't work for me, but uh, that's their belief. And, and this is also in the Philippines, you were saying. Yes, these are, yeah. these are indigenous groups that still live in the Philippines. They're, uh, they've been there thousands of years. Wow, that's fascinating. I've never seen anything like that before. This is where if you're only listening to the audio, you're really missing out because the slides <laughs> slides are fascinating. And hopefully, I, for some reason, I don't know why, but it keeps skipping ahead two slides which, when I just click the arrow. So I have to keep going back one, but I'm trying oh, to be. Well, here's, here's what I was referring to earlier, the ofrenda. It's an offering, basically. And these are all unique. The whole family gets in, uh, involved in doing them. Uh, all three generations. Uh, there's all a little competition, I think, between families, how ornate and how fancy it can be. And these are found in, in, in the neighborhoods. Um, here in the, in the Twin Cities, uh, I volunteer at an organization that uh, has a lot of Hispanic people. And uh, during uh, Dia de los Muertos, we fill up this two huge gymnasiums with these ofrendas and and music and food and joyful time. So, do, uh, do people visit their neighbors and look at their ofrendas? Is it something like communal what, that they all go around and kind of praise each other's ofrendas? Yeah, or yeah really, they do. They do and get ideas for next year for their own and uh, make comments and... Uh, compliment each other and uh, this particular one we're looking at is pretty darn in, uh, ornate, isn't it? In color it, it is. It's beautiful. Wow. That's, that's amazing. So I, so I am interested in that the Eastern European shrine, um, not decorated in the way this is, but the idea of it, of mm -hmm. putting together the offerings of food and the photographs of the ancestors and candles um that's that's very interesting to me how how similar they are maybe i'll suggest to my family they work for me <laughs> yeah I, I like the idea Why not? <laughs> well the T tibetan sky burial is another practice that depends on the vultures there's a particular uh, uh cast uh, uh people who have the hereditary responsibility to take the body out, chop it up in sizes that the vultures can take away. And they call it a sky burial and the vultures come and gather and take the remains away. Hmm. I have this slide in here just to kind of show another very different way of um, dealing with the reality of, of, of death. Yeah, it's graphic, but it just shows you that that we don't have to be so uncomfortable with the idea of death. And, and then the Sioux burial platforms, you know, going back uh, hundreds of years, and uh, I live in Sioux country here in, in the Twin Cities. This is uh, kind of the epicenter of the, uh, of, uh, the Lakota, Dakota, or Sioux cultures, different names. Um, and this is the traditional way of returning again to Mother Nature, that the ravens uh, uh, and many of these Native uh, American cultures were considered kind of like ancestors. They would refer to grandfather raven flying in the sky. Uh, and uh, so, so the birds, uh, uh, ravens and the crows would uh, be offered the remains of the people that were put in these platforms. Um, and when I first came, um, another short career I had was working as a cross-cultural um, consultant to an organization of Native American uh, uh, communities, reservations around the country. And uh, uh, I noticed that there has been a, a revival of interest in many of the old ways, including this one. I don't know if it's making a big comeback, but there's there are locations where people want that opportunity to return to the old way of putting people up on the platform instead of in the ground. 
Hmm. So if there's similarities between the Tower of Silence that we saw before and vultures and yeah. then the Tibetan sky burial and the Sioux burial platform, all at least leaving the body for the elements and for the wildlife, for nature hmm. to reclaim. Yeah. And there are some modern movements where you can have your body, uh, you know, just put in the ground or and in a few places, even I think they're going to uh, offer uh, something similar to this, where you can just be put out and uh, and after there are fewer remains to deal with, then you can uh, uh, put them in a urn or something like that. Mm. Uh, there, there's a lot of um, uh, experimentation and innovation uh, going on in the end of life uh, era area. Yeah, definitely. I feel feel like there is a movement to try to reclaim some of these older traditions. Mm -hmm. Well, burial at sea, of course, uh, is something that's been going on since people were sailing the seas. Yeah, very interesting. And I had a, a conversation a couple of months ago with a woman whose company is doing a lot of burials at sea now. And uh, it sounds it actually sounds really beautiful and peaceful. I don't know if you need a big uh, uh, um, coffin to do it. Seems like uh, mostly it's wrapped in an old sail and tossed overboard with uh, uh, some chains on to make it sink. But uh, uh, yeah, that's that's what she was mentioning. People are the bodies are wrapped in biodegradable shrouds. Uh, that... Oh, here are the <clears throat> cremation boats, the Bali cremation boats yeah, you were talking about. Out of sequence, but you can see there, you know, this is the kind of the third step in the process. Uh, the previous burial in the ground, the retrieving, the uh, um, uh, cremation ceremony, with, and then this is the last part of it. Hmm. Oh, those are lovely with uh, all, the, all the flowers, and then they just float out in the water, and mm -hmm. that's where they end up. People wade out, you know, to about armpit and deep depth and bid farewell. Hmm. Beautiful. And, and then comparing that with cremation in the U.S. Right. Oops, and oh, I have a picture here of, uh, uh, it's called resomation chamber, I think the next uh, one. Yeah. This is of the so-called uh, water burial yes and um just to the 40 miles from where i live the mayo clinic is one of the first places to to uh, have one of these and essentially it's a large pressure cooker that's used uh lye or lime and the body is uh put under a lot of pressure and heat and uh what comes out of the liquid is so benign that it can be used and it is used for watering the gardens and you know, flower gardens and stuff down in Mayo Clinic there. And uh, uh, the next site shows that the bones come out uh, like a uh, consistency of chalk and can easily be crumbled into uh, 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 a form that can be put in a, a urn and returned to the family. Any uh, metal parts, in my case, my, uh, you know, my defibrillator and, and uh, 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 a pacemaker, anybody had an artificial hip, they'll all come out just pristine and can even be uh, recycled. The, the process is so uh, sterile and, and thorough. And uh -huh. the nice thing about this process is that no uh, mercury from your uh, you know, your uh, fillings in your teeth go up the chimney there's, and there's no, uh, it's a very low, a small carbon footprint compared to fire cremation. Huh, interesting. Well, this might be a high tech uh, future for, uh, as an option. Yeah, very interesting. Um, <laughs> ashes to ashes, <laughs> <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> and of course, the cost of dying is so high. Uh, I think we find we need to find simpler, more green and uh, uh, simple ways of dealing with our end. Yes, 
Yes, definitely. And we, we are, I mean, I'm excited that there are a lot of new options for green burial, which yeah. is good to know. And um, you wrote the common goal, a good end to life. How very true. <laughs> it's one thing that you find all over the world, but how we define a good end is very different sometimes. And I was curious about that for you, um, how your travels and what you've experienced in other cultures, how have they influenced your values and your choices for yourself? Well, I want um, my uh, memorial service to be a family thing that's planned and done by the family. Don't want it outsourced to the uh, funeral industrial complex. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have my dying process outsourced to institutions that have probably profit motives for trying to keep me there as long as possible. And so Final Exit Network um, is an organization I not only belong to and advocate and volunteer with, but one I believe that has uh, um, options and choices that uh, make me able to have something closer to that of what I saw around you know, the world and, and uh, keep it uh, more natural and, and uh, I guess natural is the word. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've lost something in our, uh, as we got more developed as a nation. And I'm trying to uh, take what I've learned abroad and use it in my own, my own end of life planning. Well, I think it's very inspirational for all of us to be in touch with how other cultures have approached d death and dying and to expand our consciousness around it, around what's possible. And, and also to let us see in some ways how narrow and restricted some of our ideas about death and dying have become and and i hope it inspires other people to want to see see what's possible and get creative as they think about their own end of life and and particularly to plan ahead because that's the best way to make sure you don't end up being part of the funeral industrial complex as you mentioned is to make plans in advance yes um one, one way to kind of, for me to tie this all uh, together is that uh, the taboo about talking about end of life issues with all the family members, my grandkids know exactly, you know, they're, they're totally comfortable about what Ann and I are talking about and, and thinking and planning. And they've read our, our advanced directives and discussed them and so on. That, that's a real blessing, I think, that uh, I've been able to bring back from abroad to my own family. So uh, I'm, I'm glad for that. Um, Final Exit Network uh, has all kinds of free resources and advanced directive for dementia cases. Uh, we have uh, a professional uh, a surrogate trainer who will help train people's surrogates and give them you know, support in case the person who's supposed to speak for you when you're not able to, you don't feel they're up to the task. Um, lots of other educational um, information. And so uh, I recommend that people take a look at uh, the website and, and the Good Death Society blog um, as a way to take what we talked about and expand it in many, many directions if they wish. Oh, that's perfect. And I'll leave links to both of those final exit network and the good death society blog on the show notes for this episode. And I've been talking with Gary Wiederspawn and I just want to thank you, Gary, for uh, offering the slides and sharing all of these experiences that you've had with all of us. It's been fun. And yeah. Thank you for uh, uh, doing blog posts for us a couple of times. I've enjoyed those. Oh, you're very welcome. Happy to do that for you. Well, take care. I hope you get to enjoy more travels. <laughs> uh, I hope in, it ain't over yet. <laughs> in the near future, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. You're very welcome. 
I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gary Wiederspawn. And once again, if you're just listening to the audio, please take the opportunity, if you can, to go to the YouTube video on my channel and see the slides that Gary brought for us to look at. I'm very appreciative of him for including those slides in our conversation. I really appreciate Gary for giving us this I guess I would call it multidimensional view of death and dying around the world. He gave us a perspective that is on the one hand broad and inclusive because he brought in so many different cultures and talked about their rituals and customs. He also made it deep, and I love that he used the term deep culture and also affirmative inquiry and how he holds conversations with people of other cultures in order to learn more about them. And he was able to take us deep into the cultural values and meaning around death and dying. And then Gary also offers a long perspective because as he said, he's been on this planet for 82 years. He's seen a lot of change during that time. He's also seen a lot of death and dying and experienced a lot of grief himself in his life, I'm sure. And so it's just very valuable to have such a big, broad, deep and long perspective on death and dying and a global perspective. And to remember that we are all mortal and we're all connected through our mortality and each one of us will face the end of life. So it's important that we have deep culture as well, that we're able to go really deep into what we value and what life means to us, what death means to us, and that we also plan ahead to create our own rituals and traditions that have meaning to us. So that's what I take away from this conversation with Gary, and I'm really grateful, and he's given me a lot to think about for the future. So if you enjoy this content, please be sure to share it with other people that you think might also benefit from listening in. You can share a single episode, or you can tell them how to subscribe to the podcast on their smartphone, or just direct them to eolupodcast.com where they can find all the show notes and all of the episodes in the archives for this podcast. And that's a good place for you to go as well if you'd like to look up something that you heard in the past. And once again, I'll remind you that there are three different ways you can help support the podcast by, oh, for one new thing I'm offering is buy me a coffee, which you just click on the button and you can send me $5 for a cup of coffee. And I love coffee. So this would be much appreciated. You can also make a one-time donation through PayPal. You don't have to have a PayPal account to make that donation. There's also will be a link where you can that you can click on and make a donation through PayPal of any amount that you choose. And then finally, you can become a supporter on my page at patreon.com slash EOLU where you'll receive benefits for becoming a member. So uh, with that being said, I will be back next week with another interview for you. And until then, remember, we're here for love that as far as I'm concerned anyway, is the most important thing we can focus on during our time here, how to bring as much love as possible to this planet and how to experience love while we're here. So face your fear, be ready for whatever happens next, and love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye. <laughs>